Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Crime and Entertainment. We have here two very special guests. First, a familiar face, King. How are you? King of Connecticut, Matt Granahan makes his return to Crime and Entertainment. How are you, brother? I'm doing great, brother. How are you doing? What's going on, dudes? Nothing much. And then on the bottom, we have first-time guests here, Jake Shannon. Jake, how are you, my friend? Hey, I'm doing awesome, guys. Thanks for having me on. All right. Well, Jake, we'll get into you in just a second and try to, you know, get a little bit about your background. And we're going to talk about the Yakuza today. But first, Matt, uh, updates on the Phil Baroni situation for us. You and I done an episode on that when it first happened. So now we're a little bit more in tune with what's going on. Well, you got an update for us, brother? Yeah, we, we didn't do it when it first happened. We did it after I had uh, gotten Phil signed with uh, with Garcia Group and signed to the group of attorneys that run the TBI and, and CTE cases that were very successful uh, in terms of setting up the fund for the NFL players. And uh, that's how I was able to get Phil pro bono representation. But, I mean, let me just tell you this. Uh, he's in a He's in a good place. Uh, he's in a halfway house type situation. He gets to work out. Uh, he gets to shag the ladies. He uh, even gets tequila and uh, and some and uh, some nice uh, herbal remedies. But uh, it's just that you know this, man. I mean, we could do a whole show on this. What I've experienced with respect to the cartels in Mexico. I mean, they control everything. They control the prisons. They control the halfway houses. So what you get, Hollywood, is you get constant shakedowns um you get you get to where the family is is first shaken down for just under six figures just to get him into the halfway house and mm -hmm. you don't have a right to a speedy trial in mexico man right. uh this trial could sit for seven eight nine years so we had to do that and uh fortunately he has some family that have some restaurants in New York and uh, some ni nice one up in Saratoga, Bill Balsamo and some others. And they had a pony up, man. And then what happens, uh, and I won't get too deep into the specifics, but um, they shake you down again. Uh, so you're in the facility and then they'll have a young lady of the night come in to take care of uh, Mr. Baroni and she, and she brings crack cocaine and then they video them. And that's, you know, so that's been an ongoing thing, man. And it's just so one warning to your listeners is uh, be very careful. If you go down Mexico way, man, it's not just margaritas and senoritas. It's pretty peligroso, as they say, pretty dangerous, my man. Yeah. And uh, on another note there, Hollywood, uh, before we get into the Yakuza and I turn it over to, to Jake Shannon, I want to say um, that, I've always wanted to be a funker too, and I've always wanted to enroll in Funk U, uh, RIP to an absolute legend from a legendary family and professional wrestling. What a great long life he had. I believe he was 79 or 80, and the average man born today will only live to be 74. Age for us males is dropping. That's another topic I could talk all about an entire show dedicated to. But the funker had a great life. He was a great actor as well as professional wrestler and uh, such esteemed films as Paradise Alley. If, no, if you haven't seen Paradise Alley, dudes, you got to watch it, man. Yeah, it, it is a legendary film, um, a legendary film. It was one of, it was actually, I believe Stallone wrote Paradise Alley before Rocky mm -hmm. and Rocky was released first and um, other such great, great um, films as Over the Top and Roadhouse, right? Yeah, uh, man, man, great TV shows like Quantum Leap. I could go on and on and on, but also a man. And this is the segue with a tremendous career with his brother, Dory Funk Jr. as a tag team and as a singles wrestler in the land of the rising sun in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to turn this over. I've been on your show a number of times. I want to pipe in a few things at the end, but I want to turn this over, Hollywood Wade, to you and Jake Shannon to talk about the incredible impact of uh, the Yakuza in uh, combat sports and professional wrestling in particular. Absolutely. And Jake, this is where you come in, my friend, because you've got a uh, firsthand experience here with some of this. And for anyone that doesn't know or never heard of this, um, I'm sure most of our listeners are familiar, 
but the Yakuza is basically their version of the Italian mafia over there. Um, now tell us a little bit about, you know, your interactions with them because, and if you want, you can kind of start out with exactly what it is that you do and lay some groundwork with you and your background. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks Hollywood. And thank you, Matt. So actually, you know, uh, it was Matt. I got to, uh, thank him for hooking this conversation up and I'm going to do the best I can. I'm not like a total insider or anything like that, but, um, you know, I, I do a lot of work with, uh, within combat sports mm -hmm. and in particular kind of the nexus, the, the, the meeting point between pro wrestling and MMA and really, you know, the last, I really heard of Yakuza uh, on, on the big international news scene was actually during the demise of the Pride Fighting Championships, which is a, a really fantastic, if you can go watch the old uh, Pride Fighting Championship matches and shows, they were really amazing. Um, a UFC actually purchased the rights to them, but it was their involvement with the Yakuza that got them in trouble. And it ended up folding the entire organization. And you're right. It's it's organized crime. It's just Japanese organized crime. Mm -hmm. And in the similar way that you find in in the West, that you have kind of two broad categories. And, and there's probably more. But in, in the Yakuza, there's two broad categories. And that is the the peddlers and the gamblers. And which which is basically, you know, people fencing stolen goods. Right. And then and then the 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 racket of, of running books and, and illegal gambling. Mm -hmm. And that's really the, on the gambling side is where they connect to the combat sports field and in particular pro wrestling. And it goes all the way back. You know, uh, the Yakuza is uh, they're like centuries and centuries old in the same way that. You know, the uh, the Sicilian mob goes back to to Sicily and to the island. Well, so Yakuza goes back like hundreds and hundreds of years. And they are deeply embedded in the Japanese culture. But they are very much, uh, to, to use maybe a bad metaphor here, they are the ninjas. They stay on the down low. They don't want any kind of attention in the media. However... They're very noticeable in Japan because they're heavily tattooed and mm -hmm. some of them are uh, missing fingers mm -hmm. because there's this, this process that they go through where they uh, they actually chop off the fingers of uh, of their members to show loyalty or as a, as a bit of a mea culpa if they make a mistake. Yeah, you uh, me, I think is what they call it over there. And lots of it. times they they start with the pinky because a lot of the Japanese guys over there would use a katana and apparently the pinky is really crucial in handling that katana. So depending on what they did, they'll start off with the upper part of the pinky and some of them will go on back to where they have nothing but just a nub left. There's plenty of pictures of it online. If you, if you look that up. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting because there is some uh, lines of the Yakuza who feel that, you know, you know, and, and Matt brings this up. I brought this up before as well that, I mean, really, <laughs> if you look at our modern world, taxes are a protection racket. Mm -hmm. It's just done by a gigantic gang <laughs> called the called the United States government. Yeah. And, you know, with with these uh, these Yakuza, a lot of them when there were these changes in, in um, from the Imperial Japan to the more modern uh, Japanese lifestyle, a lot of them look at themselves as maintaining the, uh, the samurai ways in some ways, uh, but they are criminals. They are violent. They are, uh, <laughs> you know, stealing people's stuff and intimidating people. I mean, they are by what we would consider by most definitions, criminal a criminal organization, um, which again is ironic, right? Because if we look at our own governance, if the things that we get put in jail for, they're not put in jail for, which mm -hmm. is, you know, maybe I think kind of a simple litmus test 
for a legitimate government is that yeah. if I go to jail for murder, so should uh, government officials. Or if they go, if, if I go to jail for theft, they should go to jail for theft or, or running a protection racket. So anyway, you know, the Yakuza, it goes, I think the other big, big story that was international besides pride, the big story would be going back to, um, the, uh, the the great sumo wrestler who was uh, murdered because he had in- incurred way too many uh, debts and was murdered with a uh, urinated on knife. Oh. And so it went septic. Name. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not playing. And what was his name? You know, right now, because I'm driving, I'm totally are distracted. You, uh, now, Jake, I, Jake, are you referring to Ricky Dozan? Yeah, Ricky Dozon. Thank you. Ricky, yes. Dozen, Ricky yeah. Dozon. Now, Ricky Dozon, there's actually some really great, um, there's a, a couple great films. You just look them up on like IMDb or whatever. Right. But there's actually a couple really fantastic films. Ricky Dozon was an interesting character because, you know, in Japan, um, I mean, I, I don't really want to mince words. It's it's traditionally considered a very racist society. Um in so far as they're very homogenous and they don't take to outsiders well. And uh, Ricky Dozon was a half Korean, half Japanese. And so he was really not uh, taken in by either side because he was a half breed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that's why he had a chip on his shoulder. And when post-war reconstruction, you know, World War II was happening in Japan, one of the big things that they did to rally the people and, and, and get the spirit back of the people is they instituted pro wrestling because Japan is very much a combat sport oriented culture, right? They, and they never did baseball until we brought it over. They've always been doing karate or judo or, uh, you know, kendo or any, all these martial arts. They're very much a combat sport oriented culture. And, uh, uh, um, anyway, long story short, these uh, these pro wrestling matches still scripted, right? Like like the pro wrestling that we're used to here today. These pro wrestling matches were were done in such a way so that the locals were put over, and the foreigners they would bring in these big, intimidating uh, foreigners from Europe and from America, and crush the foreigners and ricky dozan was one of the big stars in this however like i said he ran afoul of the yakuza and you know the rest they say is history and yeah you know the most the, the most infamous situation there with with ricky dozan and uh joe rogan was just playing this on his show with uh with gary tonin and uh um shit Jake, help me out. I helped you out. Help me out. Gary Tonin, <laughs> and the, the greatest grappler in the country right now. Uh, the one that Curran wanted to have the match with. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't know why I'm having blanks either, man. Yeah. We're both too old here. Uh, Gordon Ryan. Gordon Ryan. Yeah, Gordon Ryan and Gary Tonin and Jake, uh, or Joe rather, was watching uh, the match where Ricky Dozen handed out a beating to Masahiko Kimura. And um, those guys being grapplers and um, from that jujitsu background, uh, Masahiko Kimura is most famous for the double wrist lock being named after him when he broke uh, Elio Gracie's arm with it. Uh, and uh, and show how tough Ricky Dozen was. He he beat the hell out of uh, Masahiko Kimura, and there was and it was always that that fabled thing when he he was in his own bar. And he was stabbed with that urine stained knife like Jake talks about. And he just kept on drinking afterwards. He didn't seek medical attention at all. And he died um, from probably sepsis or an infection because it was a urine stained rusty knife. But he didn't even go to the hospital or or the doctors. Uh, But yeah, man, just fascinating, fascinating stuff. And I know that Jake has worked uh, over the years with legends like Carl Gotch and Billy Robinson, who were icons in Japan. And I'd like to ask Jake myself, um, any stories that those guys told you uh, with the Yakuza over there? 
Well, no. They definitely kept their mouth shut about it. One thing that's interesting, and I don't mean to make any implication here, and I knew Carl very, very well. We talked all the time. I considered him a, a good friend, not just even an acquaintance or a friend, but a very good friend. He was a mentor of mine. And he would. we never, ever really brought it up. But the thing that's interesting is that when you look at that Carl Gotch, uh, for context, for people who don't know the pro wrestling side, because it's a, an organized crime podcast, Carl Gotch is in Japan known as the god of wrestling. Okay, which is quite a, a moniker. <laughs> and so he's massively influential. He was in the corner during the very first MMA, big MMA map bout between Antonio Inoki and Muhammad Ali. He was uh, cornering uh, Antonio Inoki, who ended up becoming a major uh, figure in Japanese culture. He was a, a member of parliament, a big politician, um, huge, huge ambassador for uh, Japan. And Carl was, was his, like his guy. Well, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, Carl also inspired Shuto, which was the very first pro, uh, professional mixed martial arts organization. Also, Pancras, which predates UFC. These are, the Carl was massively influential. Well, long story short, he's also missing his pinky uh, on, his, on his hand. And every time I asked him about it, he said he got it ripped off at the docks. But if you go look at pictures of Carl, he's missing his pinky. And who knows? And the thing that's interesting is when I asked Carl, because he was pretty old by the time I was able to uh, ment uh, have him as a mentor, he was busted up. His hips were bad. He, you know, he, he could hardly move and couldn't really teach me the way I wanted to be taught. I was in my 30s. And uh, he uh, I said, who would you recommend that I learn from? You know, who who? And he said, well, my best student is this Japanese guy named uh, Yoshiaki Fujiwara. And this is completely relevant, actually. And and uh, Fujiwara was also in the corner during the uh, Antonio Inoki Muhammad Ali fight. He was a uh, very successful judoka who, or judo player who then went on to really master catch wrestling under Carl Gotch. Now, the reason I say that is when I asked Carl, who should I learn from, he suggested that I go so i mean i was obsessed so i ended up orchestrating this whole thing and bringing fujiwara out to the united states and i was able to train with him uh on a handful of occasions now he brought out a translator and his name the translator was a, a guy who's teaching english as a second language in um in japan his name is robert now robert told me this story and i this hearsay but i've heard these things <clears throat> when Fujiwara retired from professional wrestling because of age, and he still actually still wrestles, but wasn't on that crazy schedule that they are. He got into film and he kind of became known as like the Harvey Keitel of Japanese gangster films. He had, the, he got that kind of casting. Well, Robert Redbear came up to me one time and he said, Hey, you know, Fujiwara's nickname in Japan is Kumicho, K-U-M-I-C-H-O, I think is the English way of spelling that. And I go, oh, okay, I don't know, what, whatever, dude. And he's like, no, Kumicho is basically the equivalent in the United States of what a godfather is to the mafia. And I go, oh, okay, that's interesting. I'm like, you know, is that because he played all these gangsters and stuff? And I, he said, well, I think so, but I've been out with Fujiwara in Japan. And in fact, the Kumicho of the Yakuza calls Fujiwara Kumicho. So, I mean, I don't know because there's so much secrecy, right? It's like almost like trying to study, you know, spy craft because there's so much misinformation. And it's so hard when, when people are trying to hide things. And then you got that layered inside of the kayfabe of pro wrestling where people are trying to hide things. So these are just stories, but they paint an interesting picture of the scene in Japan. Um, you know, in the United States, professional wrestling was also tied up with the mafia as well. And same with boxing. We know that. So there is kind of these things that I think are just maybe inherently human, like crime, I think is an inherently human problem. Right. And it transcends culture and organized crime is the same way. And I think the fact that organized crime finds itself in combat sports 
might transcend culture and just be a general human thing as well. Yeah, yeah I think there's another right. reason too. There's another reason too, Jake, um, is because it only takes one guy to fix a fight. Uh, right. You know, when you get into the world of, we talk about pride, and I talked earlier about Baroni. Well, Baroni was telling me stories in Coleman too. There's one infamous one with Coleman um, where they were offered double to take a dive. And Phil, Phil's a gangster. We we know that from, I don't think he's a killer, but he's a gangster we know from his youth. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't hesitate to take that, take that extra coin, especially overseas. But that was, that's the way it was because when you think about it, it's pretty tough to fix a, a soccer match or to fix a, a football game or any sport where you have multiple players, you don't even have to have both guys on board to fix a fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Th- I mean, this is how pro wrestling. So pro wrestling and boxing diverged, especially in the United States in terms of methodology for, for generating revenue. <clears throat> so when it came clear that people were fixing fights, both in boxing and, and in pro wrestling, they went two different ways. And it's interesting because you could see. Whoop. You could see the, the divergence, the two different promotions. Sorry, I had a call coming in. Um, and and what, what that is, is like. Ridiculous. Attention grabbing matches. And UFC is promoted like boxing, which is very straight and narrow, same match. Everything is on the up and up, supposedly. But what ended up happening is that when that divergence happened, boxing said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to control the outcome of matches through bookings. Meaning, I could create a guy in a farm league, build him up, but he's still no good. He's a tomato can compared to our champ, I know I can control the booking, control the outcomes, make money on the bets because I created this false challenger in a way. That's the boxing way. And that's kind of what happens even in MMA and in sports today. That's like Matt and I are working on it uh, jointly on a project called shoot pro wrestling, which is trying to make pro wrestling real, which is like competitive grappling under professional wrestling rules. And that's the, that's the way that we'll do it. The way that MMA is done and the way boxing is done because we're going to have legit contests, but you can control a little bit of that through who you book. Pro yeah. wrestling went a whole way where they just said, guys, this is just stupid. This whole thing is theater. It's vaudeville. Just enjoy yourselves. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's interesting what Jake points out because uh, at the, the local regional and Bush league levels, you see that so much in MMA and I'm not going to call out any, any particular schools, but there are a lot of schools that I've um, been involved with from Virginia to South Carolina to down here in Florida that run their own MMA shows. And um, what they do is they put their own guys over and they do it quite simply through booking. You, you book a guy against somebody that you know he can beat. I mean, most infamous of that was was in uh, South Carolina. Um, with a guy that uh, that took on um, Jake's um, one of Jake's top guys in the feel of worlds, Kellyanne Dunson. I mean, I booked Kellyanne Dunson's two of his fights for Billy Stanek and uh, the boxing promoter there. That were they, they were these boxing MMA shows, and I booked him against guys that he could literally ragdoll. And um, that's what Jake's saying. I mean, you can have exciting exciting matches, but you can pad guys' records. That's the boxing mentality. That's what boxing, that's what well, boxing and, and, coaches and, and promoters And do. Matt, if I may, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt. It, it's to your point that you were saying earlier that in the boxing way, anytime you're running a match, man, like, so if you're running numbers and you're trying to win through these bets, you know, what you can do is you just need to, the guy who wins may not even know that the fix is on. He yeah, absolutely. legitimately, and that's the best deal, actually, because because he's going to be like, hell no, man. His ego's involved. He's like, that guy didn't throw it. But you know, I, you and I know of a match right now that is UFC, and it was uh, Rich Franklin was not the guy throwing that match. But you could clearly see yep. about three inches between the punch in his face, and the guy took a back bump straight out of pro yep. wrestling. And and you know, absolutely. the thing is, is, 
is it's easy for people to judge. But, you know, these guys that are athletes and these guys that are in this business, it's a hard business. And, you know, man, I don't know anybody who hasn't worked for a company and didn't maybe take a ream of paper or a pencil or or do something that's unethical. I, and I'm not endorsing it. I'm saying, you know, sometimes these guys get in a bad way. And somebody makes them an offer and they're like, shit, man, you know, I got to pay for a kidney transplant for my kid. I, I, yeah. I have no problem. With not everybody those- gets, not everybody gets the government pensions and, you know, back to <laughs> what Jake's point before. And I said this, you know, a good organized crime organization has to be secretive, but the most successful organized criminal organization in the world doesn't have to be the United States government. And I want to kind of bring it to this. I mean, uh, I'm very proud to be an executive consultant with RFK Jr. Super PAC. And here you have a guy whose father and his uncle were both murdered. And it, you look at what went on with the CIA and, and they used mob henchmen, just as the FBI used mob henchmen. Some of them that were friends of mine that that uh, that Hollywood knows, you know, with with Greg Scarpa's dad, with Greg Scarpa Sr., I mean, they're the most powerful criminal organization in the world. I mean, war is the biggest racket there is. I mean, let's let's think about this. You know, we they take billions of our money to send them to other countries, not pick it on just one, but use Israel as an example. And then that money has to they is dedicated to go to to be spent on weapons that Israel buys from military contractors here in the U S that's a, that is a racket and it's a racket, you know, based on death. We aided the Saudis um, in uh, genocide at, in Yemen. At, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on one other Ukraine. quick point. Yeah. Ukraine is a classic example. Like we, we, oh, yeah. We're giving, we're giving people, we're giving people in Hawaii 700 bucks and we're giving like, so many billions, almost like trillions or whatever. I don't know the number, but it's like truly ridiculous. And you're right. I think that, you know, they say like the difference between a uh, uh, a religion and a cult is the amount of real estate owned. And it's mm-hmm. the same thing between the government and a gang. The government is just so massive that they don't have to lie. Like, dude, it is such a racket. If you want to look at a real racket war, uh, so you're, you know, that phrase war is a racket goes back to Mar- U.S. Marine Smedley Butler, who actually put down an insurrection in the United States. They were trying to assassinate FDR, a bunch of fascists. And he actually was part of like, I mean, the guy was a real stud and yeah. was like RFK. And so far as like he didn't care. He knew what was right and what was wrong. And it didn't matter about party. This is what I like about RFK. And I like about on the other side, guys like uh Ron Paul, or again, back on the, on the left, uh, uh, Tulsi Gabbard. Oh, or, yeah, yeah. You know, there's these people here, regardless of party that are like, dude, this is just not good. And I'm going to speak up and take the risk. And unfortunately, you know, you get somebody in the Kennedy family, man, they have been traumatized by standing up and fighting against this, you know, war is a racket, but look at the federal reserve system. They literally oh, yeah. make up money. The money is totally made up. It's the craziest thing. I have a master's in financial math. And I I went to the core, like, like the like, you know, like a physicist studies atoms. I went to the finest part and I'm like, holy shit, this whole thing is a total hustle. The whole thing yep. is a hustle. Unbelievable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one other point, I mean, we can all agree that Black Lives Matter. You know, I had the Black Lives Matter organization. And let's if Black Lives truly mattered. Do the black Africans that are being sold into slavery uh, in Libya, where it's the bedrock of their economy, black African slavery. Do you know why that exists? It's because um, Hillary Clinton, who cackled after she did it, um, she whacked out the the leader of the most stable country in the Middle East in, in Libya, in North Africa. And 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 black African slavery is now the bedrock of their economy. So, you know, the the U.S. government is by far the 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 most powerful uh, criminal organization in the world. And well, if we could I, bring I, it back, if we could bring it to Japan, actually, uh, did you guys yeah. see Oppenheimer? I haven't seen it. No. Yet. You know, I actually read the book 
pro the that that movie's based on it's called american prometheus it's a fantastic book and and uh christopher nolan or whatever the guy who uh wrote and directed it did a great job trying to take a giant book and put it into like three hours he did a good job but you know it's so funny because you know like we look at hiroshima and nagasaki which man we, we get down on hitler rightfully so we get down on uh stalin rightfully so we get down on mao rightfully so for genocide and you know that whole situation man i know it's controversial to say but the war had ended germany had had fallen they were done they'd surrendered and japanese were just barely hanging on we didn't have to nuke them we could have no. nuked off the shore and they would have probably been like yeah dude i'm good but we dropped two bombs on innocent men, women, and children. And that's just glossed over. Oh, well, we saved countless lives. Yeah, okay. We nuked two yeah, and cities. And you know what? If I had my choice, I wouldn't have sanctioned that. I didn't want my no tax dollars to go for that. No way. And that goes to this day. Look at all the people overseas in Iraq. A million dead, innocent Iraqis after 9-11. And we found out that was a lie. We found out yeah. that, that 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 whole thing with Rumsfeld and all those guys was completely bull, and they just all went in are, there and imperial. Jake, all wars are a lie in rackets. You know, Gulf of Tonkin and Vietnam, and oh. you talk about Japan. We're talking about the Yakuza. People think, oh, the evil Japanese, and they use so much propaganda. The evil Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. That was because we were starving them of oil. I mean, give me a break. You know, the World War II and, and even you go back to World War I, which set the stage for the rise of Hitler with the Balfour Declaration. It it's it's all comes down to money. It's a huge, huge racket all over the world. And you talk about, you know, Japan. What about some of these countries that we can't even pronounce? And what I love about RFK Jr. is he's going to change this. But I say this in dude speak, dudes. Let me say this in dude speak. The three of us dudes are out at a bar, right, man? We're just chilling. You know, we're having our cocktails. We're, we're checking out the lay days. And these Jeeps pull up, right? And we could be in South Kakalaki. We could be here in Florida just enjoying ourselves. And these Jeeps pull up. And these French dudes, all dressed in fatigues, like all arrogant, Walk in like they own the place, man. Like they own the place. That's the way people look at Americans throughout the world. And the reason is because we have this ridiculous, insane amount of bases all over the world. You know how many bases China has all over the world? One and a half. I mean, and, and RFK Jr. Is, is the guy that's speaking out about closing down those bases and bringing people home. You know, put America first is great, man. And there was a lot of things like I think Trump had good intentions, but I don't think Trump saw it through, dude. RFK Jr., dude, he would have fired. Fauci. Here's the difference. He Here's wouldn't have allowed. Between... Yeah. Here's the difference between Trump and RFK Jr. Um, you know, I'm glad Trump won only because he was an outsider and shook up the establishment of this bush clinton biden obama thing where they're all like related right and they're just this american aristocracy just running roughshod over the world i'm glad that he came in as a disruption okay but the problem that the difference between uh, trump and rfk jr is i think trump is corruptible i think he's a corruptible human and i don't think rfk is i i mean rfk jr He's an attorney. He's a smart guy. He's fought on for, against like environmental crimes, against pharmaceutical crimes. Like he's really got integrity and stood up to some very, very big, powerful people already. The fact that you want to talk organized crime, I mean, the Biden family, I know that RFK, he's been running for president. He's like, I am running. I'm collecting money. I'm doing this. And I saw some post he made where the average time is like two weeks or three weeks to get super secret service to start protecting presidential candidates. Biden refused it. Here's a guy who his dad and his uncle both were assassinated 
in a presidential arena. He's running, and the current president, who then also reclassified the Kennedy files because they should have been opened up, but Biden reclassified them. It, it and and the irony too is that the Kennedys came from <laughs> from a crime family, from running rum, mm-hmm. you know, it, during Absolutely. during prohibition. Yeah, Joe actually, uh, was a huge bootlegger, man. And I mean, he talked with Sam Giancana, who was out of Chicago down there, was a big a big shot under Tony Accarta. And him getting Kennedy winning Illinois was a huge factor in him winning the presidency. And they done all that under the, the assumption that not necessarily give them carte blanche to do whatever they want, but not come down on them you know, the way that they did. And it worked in the exact opposite way they wanted it once he got in there. And then he put Bobby in there as attorney general, you know, then come the Rico act. And it was just, you know, all the wheels fell off of the whole thing after that. And, you know, obviously there's a, we can talk for another three hours on who killed Kennedy, who was involved. I definitely dude, was a community. Dude, 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 dude. I dude, mean, that's a great to hear this. crime show. Wade, you need to hear this, dude. You need to hear this. Um, uh, RFK Jr. is really close with uh, a dude, a Cosa Nostra dude, who was involved with the CIA and um, in the assassination of his uncle. And and dude, I could get I could get through the campaign and through the super PAC. I I hate to butcher that dude's name. I know it's Anthony something, but I you know even being mostly. It's Italiano myself. I can't pronounce it. I don't, I don't even remember it. But whoever his name is, dude, dude, this is a dude you have to interview. And no one's talked to him because Lee Harvey Oswald, um, we all know, was a patsy. But, dude, even deeper than that, he was involved and the CIA was involved. Dude, the Warren Commission is not even the official. The government, subsequent to the Warren Commission, said that it was a conspiracy. And that's what. Mm -hmm. launched the word conspiracy into the into the public dialogue dude and um dude when you when you guys interview because you're both going to interview rfk jr man i got i got you guys both to set up in different formats and when you guys interview him dude you're going to get deep deep into this stuff you're going to get deep down the rabbit hole dude because because i hate the word conspiracy it's expose it's an expose and uh, these are facts, dude. Why do you think like Trump was going to release all the files and then Biden refuses to release it? It's because it indicts the CIA, dudes. It indicts the, it indicts the corrupt government organization. All the people are dead, man. Mm-hmm. And it's on record that Kennedy said that he wanted to dismantle the CIA and bash them into, I think he said, a million pieces. Mm-hmm. He, he wasn't making himself any friends and that. And that's the thing about Kennedy that's really kind of it's it's so enamoring that he had so many people pissed off at him at the time that it's hard to pinpoint one particular organization because yeah. he's, he's threatening to dismantle the CIA. Yeah. So they're looking at him. His brother's bringing down heat on the mob. So they're looking at him. Obviously you got the whole deal with Castro and Cuba, the Cuban missile crisis. Bay- yeah, Bay- but so, so you think about it, think about it though, right? Like, like, if if you share an enemy, you become friends. Yeah, and, and they were all already of those friends. Were his enemies? And very important point. They were already friends because the CIA was was already using Carlos Mont- Marcelo Santa Traficante and their connections in Cuba to try to have Castro assassinated. They were already working together, man. Yep. I mean, that's why I say. I mean. I mean, it's like I hate when the word mafia is used outside of Sicilians, but it's like the mafia is the junior mafia. The major mafia is the United States government, dudes. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the, the CIA, the FBI. I, I think this, I mean, is, this is the challenge of like the human condition is 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 this idea of corruption. And, you know, money, the way I look at money is money is just an amplifier. So if you have any flaws Money's going to amplify them. If you have virtues, money's going to amplify them. Mm-hmm. And we can see what happens to these people that are put in positions of power, right? It's just, it's, it's corrupting. And so, you know, it's so funny because this is what the, the founding fathers were attempting to mitigate by not having kings or royal bloodlines. And, but, you know, they found a way around it. 
Well, that yeah, was the thing. Definitely. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. And and really, you speak about the founding fathers uh, not wanting to meddle in, in foreign affairs and fears of, of standing armies. And then we just we become this di- this giant military industrial complex and big pharma that all of our our politicians are beholden to. Great quote from my buddy, Larry Matza, uh, you know, former former uh, Colombo uh, family guy. Uh, poly means many and ticks are blood sucking insects. That's how you define the word politics, man. <laughs> and, and you know, who's not a blood sucking insect is RFK jr. Because he doesn't have to do this, you know, much like Trump. And that's what I think endeared a lot of people to Trump. He doesn't need this. He's doing it out of his love for the country. Yeah. And I, I think that's one thing that drove Trump to is of anything we all know. And he would probably admit it. Trump has an ego, rightfully so. Um, and I did not think for one minute that he was going to go in there and attempt to run this country and do a bad job. His ego wouldn't let him. True. Yeah. Yeah. True. You know, you know, the thing with the thing that was with Trump was a, he, he had good instincts and with respect to he's one of the, and I give him credit in this regard. He's the only president in, in my lifetime uh, that mentioned the military industrial complex, you know, like post Eisenhower. Mm-hmm. Um, but Trump kind of just went along to get along. And I want to reiterate this where RFK Jr. is going to beat Trump in the general election is, is this way. He is going to expose the fact that Trump shut down our economy. He was beholden to Fauci. He let Fauci lead. And it it was it done to destroy the U.S. middle class. And Trump, while it may not have been spearheading it, he went along with it. And RFK Jr. has said that he would never have allowed that to happen. And here's the deal. They're talking now, this is crazy, um, about possibly another shutdown. They're manufacturing all this paranoia about some, some Canadian strain. So we need RFK Jr. now, man, more than ever. Yeah. One hundred percent. And that's yeah, I, I agree with country. you wholeheartedly. Like the whole uh, Operation Warp Speed, all of Fauci, all the lockdowns, all that happened under Trump. Like people want, you know, there's a this is the thing. Like I, I truly look at like Biden and Harris. They're really, really bad. Like they're like Hillary Clinton, you know, Bush level bad. And um, and because I, I'm critical of them. You know, people are so they have such an oatmeal for brains. They think that I'm pro Trump and I'm not a hump, a troll, a Trump humper either, man. The guy was at least outside the establishment. And so he exposed. I think the greatest thing Trump did was two words that he used over and over fake news. And people started seeing it for the, the news as the propaganda channel that it really is. And you're right. A guy like RFK. Dude, especially given his his, you know, he was I think he was vaccine injured. That's what happened to his voice. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, I believe and, uh, so. Yeah, dude, he, he's like, dude, uh uh-uh. uh, uh uh, ain't gonna happen, big pharma. Well, the the one thing I liked about Trump too, and there's a Chappelle quote floating around that you can find on different social medias, TikTok, Instagram, etc. He was doing the debate with Hillary Clinton, and he straight up told her he's like. He said, you're not going to change the tax laws because it's going to hurt all the people that support you. He said, yeah, I cheat on my taxes, but I do it the way every one of your donors do it. So if you change it to affect (laughs) me, it's going to affect everybody that gives you money. And he basically just said what everybody already knew, like they, they fix it to where the people that they want in power can stay in power. And he takes advantage of that system and he outed it on national TV that, Hey, yeah, it's there. You put it into place for me to play the game. So I'm going to play it. And which is smart on his part. Yeah. And I mean, you go back in history, they all loved him, man. They all loved him Uh, because he gave money, you know, to their campaigns, dude. Like he, he was, he was a host of a, of a, of a hugely successful game show. And he was one of them. And uh, it just shows you like, the group think that the media tried tries to. I mean, it, it's crazy because 
there are a lot of people who believe, and this is like it's like almost half the country, right, who voted for Trump. That if you voted for Trump, like you're some kind of a hateful racist and all this. And what I love about RFK Jr. is he's complimentary to Trump. He was part of the administration in only one regard with the vaccines. He was an advisor. But like he says in some interviews, he said, you know, I got to see that Trump really didn't have that strong spine when all that was going on, man. So he knows it, but he's not out there bashing. He doesn't have the TDS, the Trump derangement syndrome, you know, that that a lot of folks have. He's a, he's a very real dude and an honest dude. And 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 he's worked for a lot of commercial fishermen uh, representing them and for clean water, clean air and just a, just a great dude. And I'm, I'm very excited to be. He's, he's freaking jacked, dude. Like, oh, this yeah. is a guy who's totally fit, you know? Like, dude, Trump Trump ain't fit, man. He's shaped like a pear. And he doesn't work out. Biden, he doesn't exercise. Dude, yeah. Biden, like, a, a stiff breeze would knock that guy over. You know? Yeah. So it's like, you see RFK, he's, I saw some pictures of him at, like, Muscle Beach in Venice, and he's, like, freaking jacked at over 60. That. I love this, Almost man. 70. I like he's a guy 69. who's actually a, like a real man, does real man shit, has integrity, has balls, puts shit out on the line. I'm sure there's things I would disagree with policy-wise with him, but I don't care. I disagree with everybody at something because nobody yeah. is me. And so what I do agree with is a guy who's got freaking guts. He has guts. This is what I saw in Ron Paul. I saw it in Dennis Kucinich. I see it in Tulsi Gabbard. I see it in, in him. These Definitely. are important people we need to support. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he talked about him being so jacked, dude. He's did you see when he was training with Jake Shields, uh, doing yeah. all those those push up like like standing push ups? Guy's a machine. And you're gonna get to see it firsthand, man, because I'm coordinating with the super PAC and we're working with Dennis Kucinich in the campaign to get him out to uh one of the silence of violence camps, Jake. Um coming up this fall, man. Looks like it's probably gonna be in California. We've talked to Trevor. Um, who's my supervisor with the super pack and we're going to make it happen, man. We're going to make it happen. And yeah, uh, for RFK, you... RFK is a stud, dude. He's a true stud, man. And that's the kind of person, again, I'm going to disagree. I can't even believe it because I don't vote. I actually am kind of morally opposed to voting, but I actually might vote and it's even crazier. I might vote for a freaking Democrat. I can't even believe it. It's like mind numbing to me, but that's what I'm, I'm a hundred percent. The guy's amazing and deserves Support And it's so funny to see him get vilified, like the same way Joe Rogan got vilified when he was talking about ivermectin. Man, everybody's trying to make make RFK out to be crazy. But how can you? The guy is like so intelligent, so healthy. Like, yeah, I, I don't know that he'll get elected, but I know that he's going to shape the debate. And that's crucial. Yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, and, you know, he's so his knowledge is so deep. I've watched his. I loved his interview with Rogan. Um, and if you get a chance, watch it. If there's only two that you can watch, watch Rogan and Tucker Carlson, because those two dudes are similar interviewers. They let their they let the man speak. And his knowledge is just so, so deep, man. Uh, and 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 Hollywood. You're going to connect with uh, with our candidate, too, with RFK Jr. Hollywood's going to be up at Madison Square Garden uh, for the John Jones fight. Yeah, I can't wait for that, man. That's, uh, you know, being at the Garden in and of itself is is something, uh, you know, to behold. And then to be down there with that John Jones, he's fighting. I was in Vegas, which I think you were out there, too, the last time he fought. Yeah. I yeah. can't wait to to dig into some of the stuff I want to ask RFK Jr. Because I've watched other podcasts where he's very open to, like you said, not only talk politics, not only talk what, you know, he wants to do to help better this country, because I believe he actually does. But even, you know, some of the stuff involving his father and his uncle, he's not afraid to get into the weeds on it, man. And I love that about him. Most people would like, you know, I just done a story about Woody Harrelson's dad being a hit man for La Cosa Nostra and, and major drug players. And Woody's only really done one interview with Diane Sawyer where he brought it up and it was very minimal. You don't hear him talk about it. He doesn't talk about it. He brushes it away. Um, RFK is not like that. You know, he will, he will get in the weeds with you on it. And I love that. And I can't wait to, to pick his brain on that. Dude, you want to hear something cool? 
You yeah. just mentioned Woody, Woody Harrelson. Well, check it out, dude. So RFK Jr.'s wife, Cheryl, um, is close with Woody and um he's she's Woody's all over the the pictures and vid- and videos with the campaign, man. Woody's a free thinker too, dude. And check okay. this out. Check this out. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. RFK Jr.'s wife um played Larry David's wife on Curb Your Enthusiasm, and she's a cutie pie, real cutie, real cutie pie. Wow. Great actress as well. Cheryl. She's a great, a great yeah, a great comedic actress. Well, gentlemen, I'll tell you, this has been a, a fun episode, man. We talked a little Yakuza, a little politics. And one interesting fact I want to throw out there before we get out of here. You know, you mentioned around World War II, that's when Yakuza really started building its numbers. And I read a stat, and Jake, you may can confirm this, but it said more than half of Yakuza members today are over 50 years old and 10% of them are over the age of 70. So I don't know if they're still doing a lot of recruiting over there. It sounds like they appreciate those old guys that they have around the ones that, you know, the words like loyalty and respect still mean a little something. And, you know, I'm curious to see the, the impact and the stranglehold they can still have on certain aspects of society over there going forward. Cause as we've mentioned and talked about here today, when you present an opportunity to anyone, not just Yakuza or the American mob, you know, somebody's going to be there to take advantage, especially things like fight fixing and boxing. As you guys have already mentioned, you only really need one. And sometimes you can even double dip because if you take a favorite, he goes down in a certain round, you know, what comes after that, the rematch, then the rematch is bigger than the first match. Then they knock that guy out because this time the deal's off the table then you got a rematch from that. A so rubber got match. A third. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. That you know, I, t- real quick to your point about the Yakuza and the age, but I think that has to do uh, probably more uh, with a couple of things. But a lot of it is actually population collapse, and and it's just because you know they're just not breeding, right? They're they're not. There's like just not young people. It's like a culture of old people. All right. Well, gentlemen, yeah, this has been a fantastic episode, man. Matt, you got anything you want to close with, my brother? Yeah, man. I just want to say thank you to you, Hollywood. It is always, always a pleasure. And I hope everyone enjoys. I'm really glad to get uh, Jake Shannon on the show as well. And um, I want p- folks to look out because, Hollywood, we're going to be partnering with you with some old school shooters episodes as well coming up. So something else for the fans of uh, crime and entertainment to look forward to. We're going to be kicking off with a, a Phil, a Phil Baroni story with Johnny a light from, from the game, family and the America's most notorious cop, Michael Dow. That's a hilarious story that I told with our law from podcast studio. And then we're going to jump in from there. We're going to segue to the last interview that Phil Baroni did before the unfortunate circumstance down Mexico way. So guys, I'm going to hop in the pool and cool off. I'm pouring sweat out here. <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you, Hollywood. Thank you, Jake. All right, fellas. Thanks, gentlemen. Till next time. Thank you, sir.